Good morning. I'm Jessica Kerr, better known as Jessitron, and thank you for coming to Contracts and Closure, which I think is an amazing compromise between types and tests. I came to Closure from Scala, and honestly, while I was working in Scala for like a year and a half, I kind of avoided learning Closure because I was afraid that, well, what if it makes me hate Scala? And then I switched over to full-time closure, and for the longest time I was like, oh god, I needn't have worried. I can't, how do people even do this without types? I can't tell what's where. Um, but about five months into closure, I discovered a library prismatic schema, which lets me put things that, while they're not types, they look like types into my code, and I can go back and put them into other people's code, and suddenly Clojure gained a lot of charm. So now I feel like I have the things that I really wanted most from Scala, enjoyed the most from Scala, I have those, and I have things that Clojure lets me do that Scala didn't, or didn't without so much pain, it wasn't worth it. So in this talk, I'll talk about um, the prismatic schema and what we have now as far as contracts and Clojure and what that lets us do, and a little bit of, a couple of the things that I think are really fun in Clojure. And I'll talk about things that uh, we can't do yet with prismatic schema, but I'm pretty darn sure we could, that will get me even further along the way of everything that types, are, that I cherish types for. And finally, I'm gonna talk about something I discovered along the way that, that I didn't really expect, but in the end, I think it, like, it kind of solves microservices a little bit. So, so that's unexpected. Mostly, this talk is about these two questions, which are super important to science and the philosophy that underlies it. What do we know and how do we know it? In this case, most of what we care about is we know that this code works, that it returns certain results and has certain effects under specific circumstances. And how do we know that? Uh, it works on my box. <laughs> so it works on my box, or it works in a few boxes, is anecdotal evidence. Um, most of the real way we know that our code works is informal reasoning. Informal reasoning is, well, it worked here, and it worked in these cases, and I infer that it will work in all the cases that I care about. Um, and when we want to do better than that, when it's important enough to do better than that, we can try to use um, harder forms of how do we know, like formal proofs. So in, in the type language, you set up the types, and um, the compiler provides some sort of proof like evidence that uh, your program hangs together. That when you say you get this kind of thing on your function input, you always get that kind of thing, or it wouldn't compile and it would never run. That's awesome, and that's like the gold standard, and it's fantastic when we can get it. Unfortunately, we can't always get it. For one thing, sometimes it's too much work. But more significantly, it doesn't scale outside of one program. It doesn't scale across languages. It doesn't scale across companies. And these days, most of our software systems are not written, they're assembled. And we need to be able to bring different parts. And we need to say, how do we know this works? Because in the end, at some point, you get to the informal reasoning of, this works because I looked at the documentation, and that's what it said, and that's what I passed it, therefore, this and that. We always get back to informal reasoning at some scale. But there's an in-between. Um, the formal proofs, that's like, that's math. That's the math of programming. And when math can't explain yet everything that goes on around us, we turn to science. And science works based on experiments, experimental evidence. Um, the scientific laws that we use aren't proven laws in a logical sense. They're based on observation, lots and lots of observation. In our, in, in, in our world, we have every test is an experiment, so it ranges from the anecdote of works on my box to some example tests that run regularly on CI uh, to generative tests, which are hard. But our experiments are only as objective as the experimenter, which is not very. Um, and what I really want to get across in this talk is that the best things we can do with either kind of proof, with experiments or with formal proofs, is to support more informal reasoning, more and better informal reasoning. Because while informal reasoning scales, 
all the way to the detail level of, if I give this instructor instruction, I know that the compiler and the operating system and the hardware are going to act like this, and therefore this will happen next. All the way from that detail level up to the program level to the system level to the business level of why the heck are we doing this anyway. A good developer thinks at all those different levels and it's all informal reasoning. On the other hand, informal reasoning does not scale outside of our heads. We're limited by our own working memory to what we can do. And what I want is tests or proofs, types, that support, um, act as a springboard for my informal reasoning so that I can get more in my head and be, I want some axioms that I can say, how do we know it? And I want to use those as I'm thinking about things like why am I doing and what do I even want this program to do? So I came from Scala. And in Scala, we have types, beautiful types, lots of types. And uh, one of my favorite things about this is one of my favorite things about functional programming, which is you see something going in, a report data, and you see something coming out. In this case, it's an Excel sheet. And since I'm a good functional programmer, there's no side effects, and I know that's all this function does. I love that. And the types, you can click into them if you're in IntelliJ or search for them. Um, and you can explore those, they're discoverable, and they're right there in the parameter list telling me what this function does. I don't have to go look at the code to figure it out. And there's, there's more. So there's research that shows that after like a year of learning to program, static typing improves programmer productivity. Sorry, it does. But more interestingly, the biggest impact of static typing to programmer productivity happens right here in the function declaration. Type parameters that are declared and return values that are declared, this has the biggest impact on productivity because programmers are more likely to use the function correctly. We, let's face it, we don't read the documentation. I don't want to look at the code. I mean, closurists and Rubyists, they love to look at code. And while that makes them better closure programmers, it also leaves open uh, the ability to depend on implementation details rather than the API that that developer consciously decided to expose. And, and tests as documentation, please. I never go to the, a whole entirely different file in order to read the tests to figure out what this code does. No, I'm just going to look at what's here. And what drives me crazy about closure is that's not there. All right, so types act kind of like a skeleton. They, um, they build up your program from bones first. And if you like type-directed development, which I do, this is awesome. But sometimes you don't know exactly what you're dealing with, and you just want to explore the solution space freely and let the data flow as it as it does and as you accumulate it and as you need it. And this is where closure really shines. So if I look at my format report function in closure, uh, that something goes in and uh, something comes out. <laughs> but without reading the code and performing the informal reasoning of playing compiler, I don't know what. Uh, this is awesome when the, the hash map of hash maps and sequences that is that report data is in your head while you're coding this before you fully understand what the solution is and you're exploring that space and you've got that hash map of hash maps in your head because that's what you do in Clojure. That's the idiomatic way to pass things around. That's awesome. But when somebody else wrote this, or it could have been me a long time ago, that counts as somebody else, a long time ago like last week, um, and I come back, and this was my actual experience at Outpace. I come to this function, and I'm like, okay, I need to do something different based on some piece of data that's in that report data. Ah, maybe it's one of the parameter values. I know it's in there, but I have no idea where. The, as far as I can tell, the idiomatic closure way to do that is to stick in a print lin, run it in the REPL, and see what's there. Well, that tells me what's there in exactly one case on my computer right now, and that is not good enough. I want to know what I can count on being there all the time. So what I can do now that I know about prismatic schema and these really cool contracts is I can go back and as I'm figuring out what the heck is in that report data, as I go digging through the code, I can document that 
in schemas, and I can test that my assumptions or my deductions, whatever, my informal reasoning is correct. So say I need to find out what's in that report data, so I back up a step. This is where format report is called. And oh, this is, uh, this is one of the beautiful things about closure is you get these really nice data pipelines of data going in and it's going through. That up there, that uh, pointy thing, the skinny rocket, that is called the threading macro, which is a horrible name because it has nothing to do with threads. It's not threads like concurrency, it's threads like sewing, which why would you think about that? Anyway, what that means is take the first expression, evaluate it, and whatever it gives you, sew it in as the first argument to the next expression and evaluate that and then sew that in as the first argument to that lonely function there. And it makes like this pipeline. Uh, fetch events has a side effect. I like to picture that as a water wheel of data flow as the data changes shapes and gets added. All right, so I can see that the blue jelly bean comes from analyze ad performance, so I'm gonna have to dig into that. Now, realistically, this isn't the code that I found. This is what I refactor the code to eventually. This is how I want it to look. Really, I had to dig through about 16 different functions and it was really annoying. But if I dig into ad performance, I can find another uh, data flow pipeline there. And this is one of the things that I love in Clojure but would never do in Scala because it's too big a pain. This is um, a gradual construction. So I start here with some events and then I'm gonna group them up and then I'm gonna add a summary and I'm gonna add a total and in the end, I'm gonna output whatever all that stuff glommed together is, which is nothing right now except a hash map because I haven't given it a name yet. Um, but I, I really like this gradual construction pattern where you just pass your data along and add to it and refine it as you go. And you wouldn't do that in Scala because you would have to create a type for every intermediate piece and that would be a pain in the butt. Or you could use a hash map, but then you'd have to move it into a type and it wouldn't be worth it. In Clojure, I can keep that complete flexibility of data and then I can come back later after this is solidified, after it's gonna stay this way for a while, and then I can document it. And then I can execute that documentation as contracts. Okay, so let's do that. I'll start with the events. Now the events, it's easy for me to figure out what that is because that makes a SQL call and that actually has structure. I know what that means. Um, so the events have a who, a what, and a when, whatever. And one nice thing about these prismatic schemas, these contracts, is their structure, they're made of regular closure data, so they're structured parallels very closely the data that they're describing. So if I want to describe this data as a schema, I say, okay, I'm going to define an event, and this is just standard closure, closure data, but it functions, it is interpreted by the prismatic schema contract library as a description. Uh, so I can have the same set of keys, and then um, any sort of class is a schema in the sense that it represents something of that class. And then if I bring in the schema core library, of course I, I get like shorter names for string and number and the common sort of thing. All right, that's it, that's one event. Now this thing down here is actually a sequence of events, it's many events. Oops, oh, oh, but before that, uh, this string thing doesn't tell me anything, so really I'm just gonna give those names and I'm gonna define that up higher and it's just gonna resolve to string, but. This also lets me give things names, which is fabulous as I'm reading through the code and figuring out what it does and learning the domain. And then I put that between square brackets, which is a closure literal syntax for vector, um, and that represents to schema, not specifically a vector, but any sequence of any number of events. Okay, so that is gonna fit, that, that uh, schema right there is gonna be the return value of fetch events. So now that I've figured that much out and I've created that little schema, I can go and I can add it and I'll bring in schema core and I'll replace the standard closure defin function definition with the schema one that lets me say defin function name bird face sequence of events. And that represents that that's the return value. We'll add some bird faces later to the parameter lists as well. And when I do this and I run my code in production, 
and something comes in or somehow we get something back from fetch a bench that does not match that schema, nothing happens because by default, the validation is off and there's various ways to turn it on. I could tell it to always validate the schemas of this function, this particular function, and I might if it was like an external API and I want to throw an exception if it's bad. But one thing I really like about schema is that it doesn't screw with my production code. It doesn't cause exceptions. I don't want exceptions. If you can handle it, just handle it. Enclosure's really good about being able to just handle the data and have good default behavior. Um, right, so nothing happens in production, and that's great. It doesn't break anything, even if I'm wrong as I go back and modify the code. So then I go to the tests, and here's some tests that already existed. I didn't add that. And when I run it and the schema is not accurate, then nothing happens because it doesn't break this either. I have to specifically tell my test in each test namespace to validate schemas. And once I say that, then finally, all of the function schemas will be validated. The contracts will be checked on the way in and the way out. Okay, so now we've got, now, now I can run the test and make sure I was right so far. And then I can move on to building up into bigger and bigger schemas because these compose just like any other data structure, which is awesome. So my, my grouped up events are like sequences of sequences of events, and that's easy. And then we come over here and all right, well, what the heck is that? So it's got an event, no, a sequence of events, some, some little bunch of them. And it's got this thing, ah, we'll call it a summation, I'll have to find that somewhere else. You know, and when I do this, I'm gonna define that somewhere else as like any, the, like the default, I don't care what it is, schema. And, and I can do that, I can give it a name, I don't have to dig into it until I want to. Now, this represents a pair, really. Uh, in Scala, I would use a tuple. Uh, here, I can say the schema for this is actually uh, the, as a her heterogeneous sequence. I've got one event and one summation. And then I have to give them names, which is annoying. Additional names. I already gave them names. Anyway. Uh, what I love about this is that it's a heterogeneous list, and this is idiomatic in Clojure. If you've got two things, you stick them in a vector and you pass them around. And you can do that in Scala with tuples, but these I can like concatenate, manipulate. And if you've ever done heterogeneous lists in Scala, like with shapeless, just back away slowly until you can turn and run because it's scary. This is one of those things that Clojure's like, you want to do what? All right. And you, I can validate it with contracts that proving to the compiler that that kind of thing works concatenating heterogeneous lists and keeping them type safe in Scala is just like, ugh, just, it's just not worth it, people. So that's a bonus. All right, so now that I've got that, I'm gonna name that a group, and now I've got a sequence of groups, and then I can pass it through, and I can add the other things, so I'll throw in a hash map, and then I can add the totals, and I can add the headers, and now we have the jelly bean. So I can give that a name. It's a report data. And now my jelly bean isn't blurry anymore, it's pretty well defined, to the extent that I need it. Maybe I never did go in and define what totals is. But I've got this far, so I can do exactly as much typing as I need, and then I can stick it on the functions. Here it comes. So analyze add performance now returns uh, a report data uh, out of a sequence of events and the parameters. And I can document that and verify it in my tests. Yay! Except, of course, that never works the first time. So then I get to my tests, and here's just some existing tests, and as soon as I add validate schemas to the top, I get some angry error message that is not this pretty. I'm, I'm really trying not to go into the error message rant, but it's probably gonna happen. Uh, but basically, I will get an error message that tells me that that empty map is no longer valid. Now, one of the things I love about Clojure is that when I'm writing tests, I don't need to worry about any of that extraneous data. I don't have to gather everything I need to construct a valid what's it type it, just in order to pass it to the function so that I can physically call the function. I can pass nil, I can pass whatever. If the function doesn't hit it, the function will be like, yeah, whatever, doesn't care. And I really like that about closure. But when I start validating the schemas, I limit that. So I can turn off validation, but I actually do want it to validate the other part. So that's kind of a pain. So in a type, if you have types, you have constructors. I think it's polite whenever you define a schema like this to make a generator. 
So a generator is like a little factory that produ randomly produces some sort of valid params in this case. Um, I bring in test.check, which is the closures um, generative testing library, and I use the generators, and I, they compose a lot, um, a lot like the schemas do. You can even generate schemas. Uh, Zishan has a library schema gen that, no, you can generate generators from your schemas directly if you want to. I don't usually uh, because typically I, there's more business knowledge that I have about these than is encoded in the schema specifically. So maybe I want the title to never be empty and the start date is before the end date and that kind of thing that makes sense. So I usually make my generators by hand. It's not that bad. After you've read all the code in the generator library, because Lord knows it's not documented, well, sufficiently. It's, it's very well explained, but for the details, got to read the code. Anyway, so I build this generator, and now I can go back to my test, and instead of an empty map, I just sample one from the generator. What I like about this is my test now explicitly says, okay, the input is these events and any parameters. So this test now sort of documents the fact that it doesn't care about the parameters, whereas the empty parameter was kind of Amb ambiguous about that. Maybe it was important that it was empty, probably not, but you can't be sure. Now you're sure it doesn't matter what the parameters are for this test. I like that. Now once I've got these generators, then I build them up, build them up the same way as the schemas, and then I can do this. This is a, a property-based test, a generative test, that just says for all events for my event generator and parameters for my parameter generator, assert true. Basically, just, just run the function. So the generators are a little bit of work, but really, they're, they're not that hard. Um, the hard part of property-based testing, which is beautiful because it gives us tons of experimental evidence, but the hard part is writing the properties, is figuring out how to validate the output when you don't know what the input was going to be. Well, forget it. I could validate stuff on this if I want. You know, I, I probably would, something like, I don't know, the number of events in the totals matches the events going in or something nice and consistent and easy. But basically, all the properties are encoded in the schemas. This, this generative test is functioning as my compiler. And it's just validating all those properties that are documented in line in the function where they belong. So what do we know? The schemas. How do we know it? Generative tests, yay. So, I mean, on, on the side of types and tests, okay, I pretty much firmly came down on tests. As long as it looks like types. <laughs> so what can we know from the schema specifically? We can describe the data shape, and we've seen a bunch of that. And interestingly, uh, it describes the shape in a very duct typey sort of way. If you give me the required keys, that's good enough. You don't need to be able to link in the class file to make sure the type is correct. So if, if it looks like a duck, well, I mean, you look at it, and is it a duck? All right, let's quack it. We can also know some boundaries around the data because these are runtime checks. So everything you wish your type system could tell you about the length of the list or whether it's not empty, it's runtime. It's right here. We can make sure our title is not empty and it's always capitalized. That's a business rule that can be encoded directly in the properties which are explorable from the function declaration. And there's the code for that. The only interesting bit about this is that it's an arbitrary predicate in there. I can do whatever I want. I can, I can also check for relationships within values. I can do things like check that this is a map and the start date is before the end date. As long as it's within the same schema, that's easy. So there's some things that I can't do yet. And I wish I could, and I think, I think we could get there if we choose as a community. One thing is the produce type, so the inner types, the type parameters. I really want to say this is a generator of this type. But that's, that's kind of tricky because um, you can't check that just by looking at the generator unless you annotate it somehow, which is an option. But, but that would involve like requiring schemas to be defined in multiple places. And part of the beauty of this is that the schemas are exactly where they are. They're nowhere else. There's never any dependency on fitting schemas together because it's all just runtime. Does it look like it matches? 
So I've got this, what I'd love to be able to say is that params is a generator of params. And I don't want that schema check to check right now when this is created. Instead, what I want it to do is actually modify the value and wrap the generator in um, like functor map it across a validation check such that if it ever gives me um, the wrong kind of thing, I find out about it then with a reference back to this line that says, oh, you told me here this was going to produce params, and this one isn't. So I, I implemented this like a stubby version of this um, that would, it, only for generators, you give it a schema, and it'll return a generator with that, that wrapping check around it, and then it'll give you nice error messages, like here's the generator that didn't didn't succeed, and here's the whole value, not just this, this red one is what I actually got back from schema. Not keyword, persistent array map, no kidding. Um, right, so this, I mean, I implemented this as a very stubby thing, but that's part of exploring, let's find out if it's useful, and if it is, then I can abstract it. Because another one um, that I would love to be able to say in our types of is sequences. Like right here, I've got a sequence of events but there, this does not behave the same way with the validation checks on as off because if that is a lazy sequence of events that's returned, the validation check will realize the entire sequence. In tests, that's usually okay. In production, that would be bad. What, but what matters is the behavior is different. And we had some bugs that, that behave differently in test and production. It was really frustrating, and this was why. I would love to be able to say this is a lazy sequence of events. Don't check it now, instead wrap it, map it across a validation check, and if it ever doesn't produce an event, let me know about that then with a reference back to here. So that would be awesome. So I've got it for generator, I don't have it for a lazy sequence yet, um, and, but the other thing is the functions. So higher order functions are a pain in the butt when you don't have types. I see a lot more uh, really small little functions composed into other functions in Scala. I do that in Clojure now and then, but it's painful because I really have to keep all the function types in my head and it's all up to me whether I get it right. And that's when I really miss the compiler. So I would love to do the same kind of thing here where if you declare a function type, right now in schema you can declare a function type and schema looks at it and goes, is it a function? Ah, close enough. I don't, it, it can't check the return values until it returns something, but it could wrap it. And I would love for it to do that and give me a reference back to where I said this function was supposed to be int to string and it just returned a Boolean. That would be awesome. I think it's possible. Um, oh, and speaking of which, uh, back to the function thing, uh, Lono Cloud, someone at Lono Cloud, David McNeil, I think it was, has uh, an implementation of that, but it uses schemas, the annotations that schema puts on the, the vars so that it is matching schemas against schemas. It's not all runtime. But it's close. It's something one could use. All right, so uh, that's produced types. We, I would also love to be able to specify the relationship between types to like type parameters at the function level. This uh, sample one function, which sadly is not built into test.check, I would love to say you give it a generator of A and it returns an A. But I can do that right now, but I have to like make my sample one a function that returns a function so you can give it the A and then give it the generator and then it could do the check. Um, and, but I don't like this because it involves changing code. It requires actually changing the code that already uses sample one. And that, I'm not okay with that because I'm coming back and I'm annotating other people's stuff. Uh, so I did make a macro that does this except the generator of stuff isn't implemented because that doesn't exist in that form yet. Um, and this one produced the, the macro, which it's not a masterful macro, I'm just, it's like my second ever closure macro, but still, it totally outputs a function that I can call and I can specify the schema or I can not. So this would let me support the existing sample code, the existing code and also add checks where I need them. And that would be awesome. As another example, the, the interesting part here is actually the merge. Uh, add headers, if I was gonna type that, I would be like, anything I pass in gets the headers added to it. 
And I like that because it expresses that merge as just a standard closure map merge function and I can use it at the type level, which is kind of cool. And then same thing, it, you can call it with or without the schema of what you expect. Okay, so one more thing that I wish we could know is relationships between the return values and the uh, input values at the value level, that was at the type level. Uh, and this exists already in Clojure as post conditions, so I can add this post condition to this function that the return value is just as lazy as the input. So if it wasn't realized coming in, it's not fully realized on the way out. I would love to be able to say that. Um, and, and I could, but these post conditions don't have that great property of only being checked when you ask them to be checked. So I totally did this like last week. I added a post condition and we pushed some stuff to production and the post condition was false and it threw an exception and failed everything and we had to roll back. I, I don't really want that. I mean, I learned something from that. It's nice to know that whatever I thought was true was not true, but I'd rather not learn that in production. Okay, so that's a negative, but we could implement that. There's, a, there's another um, schema-ing, like data definition language, it's called Herbert, that has some really cool like core.logic looking matches between the values, but it doesn't do the, the function contract thing. So I think it would be cool to combine the two. All right, between what we do know and what we could know, I'll settle for what I do know, I'm still pretty happy. But if I had all of this, then I think it would be the best of both worlds of the skeleton and the octopus of being able to explore the solution space and then add the boundaries we need. I think that would be fantastic. Almost as fantastic as an octopus in a coconut. But there's one more thing that I discovered um, that surprised me, because I thought the interesting part of preparing for this talk would be like wrapping the function schemas and stuff like that, but then I totally got interested in the organization of the code, which is not usually very interesting, but as I'm trying to do this really right, one thing I notice frequently is that as I start adding these schemas, they start cluttering up my code and they look like closure data, so they're not very easily distinguished. So I start moving them off to a separate file and I have this schema's namespace and I like to bring it in as T because I'm pretending they're types. Uh, and then, the, so there's a dependency with, within my, uh, my source, source of my project. The implementation depends on the schemas and that, that's fine. And then on the test side, I have to start moving my generators off, and that pretty much parallels the schemas file pretty closely. So I've got the generators and the tests, and they depend on themselves, and here comes the source. Uh, and we get this little dependency graph that looks like that. And that's fine, and this is totally fine, as long as the only person's testing I care about is mine. But if this is a service, and it's not just about me anymore, there's a problem. Oh, here's a, here's a couple more tests that happen to be just kind of off there in the test directory looking, looking stray. But you gotta test the schemas and the generators, or at least I usually do. Okay, but if somebody else is going to call my service, say this is a closure service, and other closure services call it, I want them to have access to my schemas. I want them to be able to check their input against my parameter schema, and I want them to know exactly what to expect from my output which gets kind of ugly because now they have a dependency that happens to include my source code, which I don't want them calling because this is supposed to be a service. It's supposed to be encapsulated. Um, and then it gets really ugly when they need to use my generators. If they're gonna use my schemas, they need the generators too. But for their test to have, I get to move that over there and all of a sudden the client source has a dependency on test.check? No, no, I, I'm not doing that to my clients. Uh, so I was, I was bemoaning over this and a coworker pointed out to me, this is the perfect case for the dependency inversion principle. Dependency inversion principle says high level code, your client, does not depend on low level code, my service. Both depend upon abstraction. I love abstraction. All right, but in this case, it, it gets a little interesting. So the abstraction here is the schemas that specifies the structure and the properties. Um, and if I put this into a square and then turn it into a diamond and rotate it, then it looks pretty. And the dependencies are now going down. And as long as I put each of these in a separately releasable unit, 
then the graph stays pretty. The client comes in and the source depends on the source things, and the test depends on the generator's things. This looks a little bit like a library. Uh, and, and this is totally possible, but these are each separate projects. I'm, I'm gonna back up and go over that one more time. And now I've added in like my little test for schemas and test for generators. And what that looks like is this. So I've got four separate Lineagen projects in the same repository, which I mean, the initial reaction to everyone that I tell this to at work is like, <laughs> but, but I think it's actually useful and we can make the build tools better. I'll have a template for it in the next couple weeks. Um, as I've been, I've been exploring writing a Slack client with this architecture and it's still exploratory, but it's, this, it produces some interesting things because the schema tests are with the schemas and the generator tests are with there and the tests for my actual service are in their own separate project and that's what needs to run on CI. So the client comes back in with its source and its test, except if this isn't uh, like a REST service or generally uh, running in a separate process, then it's not a direct dependency on the implementation. The dependency is actually on the schemas, on the abstraction where it belongs, and it just calls that. The beauty of this is that I really wish we had this kind of structure in Outpace uh, when we're connecting a bunch of closure services, because the alternative is when I want to know what service calls my service, I grep the repository for hard-coded URLs that I dug out of the Nginx configuration. No, the only thing worse than dependency hell is invisible dependency hell. And not making those dependency explicit is just papering over it and hell will burn right through. So I want that explicit dependency. That tells me in the client's project CLJ, I depend specifically on this version of the APIs and the guarantees that are made in these schemas. And then the generators let the client do the same sort of experiments that I can do. So I've got like my, my tests up there, which the documents go there too. So that becomes an executable specification up at the top. And I can do experiments on that and so can the client. In fact, I could go one more and add some testing tools in there. Akka has a test kit module and it serves the same purpose as like HSQL if you're testing against a SQL database. If you're going to do a lot of experiments, they have to be fast, you can't be going over the network, and you can't be relying on somebody else's service being up. So this is a problem. We often have, um, like back at Monsanto and TPS, we couldn't test if somebody else's service was down. Well, that's crap. I want to be able to run my tests in memory, regardless of anybody else's upness. And that's what the test kit gives us. And then the tests at the top are doing the job of verifying uh, there's, there's a really easy, easy style of property that is reference implementation where you're testing the real implementation against the test kit implementation and making sure they work the same within the bounds of the test kit. And then you can also test your real implementation further. So this is the science here. This is the connection. And then by, by including that test kit, I'm enabling the client to make that connection as well. And this is all evidence in the how do we know category of supporting their informal reasoning. I don't have to rely on just the documentation and what it says because the documentation is not complete. In writing a Slack client, I, I, there's all kinds of stuff that documentation doesn't say. Oh, a message always has text. No, sometimes it has an attachment with text in it. It looks the same on the screen, but it doesn't come across the same in the API. Surprises. Okay, so. Speaking of which, what happens when the client and the service are not in the same language? So what if I'm not within the same company? What if I'm Slack? What if I'm Elasticsearch? What if I'm Mongo? And I want my users to be able to do this level of reasoning and experiment with mine. Well, then that diamond becomes the native client. Cl native client. Uh, Mongo has native clients in all the major languages, and they discovered that this lets them improve their implementation incrementally because uh, it's their client exposing a carefully designed API, and they know which implementation details matter and which don't. Uh, so while you're building that client, if you also add in some test kits and stuff, then you really raise the level of work that your users can do. The top diamond 
uh, becomes, it's, it's, or the top of the diamond might seem easy to neglect, which is why it needs to run in CI regularly and produce the documentation that the users use because that is the pinnacle of what can we know and, and how do we know it. I think overall, it gives us a good compromise of a bounded octopus of we explored stuff and then we put the boundaries in place that we wanted to document and as you need more documentation, you can add it. So I do this with closure and prismatic schema and test.check, but you could do the same ideas in any language. You can use types, you can use contracts, whatever libraries are available and generative tests. ScalaCheck is my favorite generative test framework. And you can do science. And then if you add native API definitions and some sort of in-memory test tools, then you let everyone who uses your service do science. In the end, um, I, I mean, I'm totally coming down on the side of experimental evidence because I think in this way we can scale it across distributed systems um, and it's not limited to just what's in our language. Although I love that people are expanding the variety and the scope of what we can do formal proofs on and that's super important. But in the end, it's like Tom said a minute ago, your tool is less important than the relationships it supports. In this case, I think both formal proofs and experimental evidence are less important than the informal reasoning that they support. It's our brains that they're there to enable. Uh, I'm Jessitron. There's some examples that are still evolving up on my GitHub. Here's all the resources, and I'll tweet a link to these slides because you're sure as heck not gonna write that stuff down. Questions? We have plenty of time. Wow, yay, look at all the questions. So, is anybody, oh, is anybody working on IDE support for these contracts so you know while you're typing rather than, I mean, not type, you know what I mean, while you're entering your code, whether or not you're doing something wrong? That's a good question. Um, I, I have no idea. Um, in IntelliJ, it's actually, it's actually a pain because um, if I change my schema, I have to recompile that. It's a macro. I have to recompile my source, and then I can run my tests. Um, so, no, the closest thing would be um, constantly running tests in the background. And even that's a little tricky because it can't always figure out what all needs recompiled when I change a schema. If anybody else knows, please speak up. Question. Um, her question types usually tells me what, they never tell me how, right? So your one argument was that we don't like looking at the function because we don't know what it returns or what it gets in. But I love looking at the function, I love reading my closure code, but the argument was that people, other people don't, right? Uh, so the question is, would you use schema and uh, typey things only on client-facing functions or APIs? Ah. And uh, you would you know, prefer the simpler way to me to handle everything else because it, 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 it is cool, it is constraining the octopus, but it also adds some complexity and syntaxy things that uh, might not even be easier to maintain later on. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's one of the costs of all those experiments is unlike, unlike the formal proofs where you kind of like, you get some stuff for free from the compiler, you don't get anything for free in tests. You gotta write those tests and you gotta maintain those tests. And I completely agree with you. Tests belong on the outside um, and the, the documentation belongs on the outside of um, um, tests. They, they don't enable change, they prevent change. So you wanna be specific about what change you're preventing which is that API, and that way, if you have to change a schema, you know it, you release a new version of that, people can detect that uh, if they have a, a strict dependency. So yes, I, I, I am careful. I only use it inside. I only dig down and start adding schemas at a lower level if I'm trying to locate a bug. If I'm trying to be like, okay, I, this isn't behaving like I expected, where is it going wrong? So then I'll start documenting what I think each bit is returning. Yeah, totally. Also. Um, at Outpace, I w we did some, um, some of our APIs would say always validate and would actually use the schemas to check incoming data, but only on the outside. 
Is, is there like a story for combining schemas and say like core.typed or that sort of thing? I mean, is oh, that something you've experimented with? Or I, I, I'm not really familiar, but I could imagine that maybe those can work together in an interesting way. So if you Google that, you get a nice Stack Overflow answer from Ambrose that he totally thinks they could combine well. Um, but so one of the differences between schemas and core.typed is that core.typed is checking like type declarations against type declarations um, and whatever it can deduce, it does a lot of that. Um, so the benefits you get from core.typed are dependent on how widely you use it. And schemas are totally drop in, put it in just one spot and you get benefits in just one spot. Um, so that's, that's my excuse for liking schema. Two more questions, okay. I'm curious, if I wanted to start using it right today, is there any libraries or any tooling that would allow me to take, say, code I already have that's already very complex and turn that into a schema automatically? Hmm. To go from code to schema, I don't know of anything. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. Um, usually it's, it's, I just use it to document what I think is there to whatever level I know, but um, yeah, you'd think. I mean, if core.typed can figure out types to a good degree, you think you could translate that into schemas instead. That could probably work. Hmm. Cool idea. So I'm wondering how long have you done this and have you found that your teammates just go behind you and say, let's throw out this trash because you've just put a whole bunch of constraints in the dynamic language and does it stick? You know, because I've, I've done things where I've gone and dynamic languages and you clean up things and you formalize it and somebody comes in and they have to make a feature work and they get rid of it because it's getting in their way. Oof. Uh, that's, okay, so that's a good question. Um, my experience has been, my teammates have been like super grateful. Oh my God, thank you for documenting this stuff because none of us understood it. Uh, but it would probably be, it, it could totally be different if, um, if they did already understand it. And frankly, as far as like, as far as like the internal structure, if it is getting in your way, throw it away. I mean, the, the outside API, you better be conscious about that because that's affecting other people. But um, it, in the, the little inside, like local variable types effectively, um, I'm all for throwing those away. They're like unit tests. They're there to help you code or to help you find a bug. And if they get in the way afterward, yeah, toss them. Um, so I would, I would only argue with them if they wanted to throw out schemas that were at the outside level. Um, and, and realistically, probably anything that I put on the inside was in order to build up to the outside. So it's okay if they remove those little annotations on the inside, as long as the schemas are still making them aware. You change the API, you better let people know about that. Any other questions? Okay. Well, uh, oh, uh, I don't work for Outpace anymore, by the way. They laid us off, so I'm technically unemployed. Um, if you have any remote closure or Ruby jobs, let me know. And uh, thank you very much.